My new interactive experience, similar to a choose-your-own-adventure project PCI, will be released this Friday for everyone at midday central time. Friday the 20th, midday. Hey noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and you know, not so long ago I made a video called What if an ancient Roman saw our world and it was a little bit of a speculation if you will, trying to hypothesize, hey what if you could resurrect a Roman, we chose the imperial period specifically, uh, what would they think, what would they do? And it's the second one down here with this, sorry if I say that myself, with this awesome thumbnail and it's, as you see, what if an ancient Roman saw our world and it's not the only sort of speculative alternative history video, we have the one at the top here, what if the West and Roman Empire never fell. So I've got a few like this. Oh, today, as you could see from the title, it's not a Roman. We're going to the Middle Ages, my friend. Oh, look how it sparkles. That looks awesome. I'll wear it at the end of the video. In a similar fashion, or with a similar pattern that we did for the previous iteration of this now, I suppose, series, we're going to discuss this from the perspective of a medieval man, who is, of course, a nobleman, because when we say knight, sometimes people think all we see in iconography, they are all knights when they're wearing armor, they're fighting with a sword and a shield, but that's not the case. Sometimes they're men at arms. They fight in the manner of the knight, but they haven't been necessarily knighted. So in this case, just to be specific with what we're talking about, we're not just talking about a mounted soldier, we're talking about mounted nobility. So a knight, he has armor, he has swords, he has what have you, perhaps even a little castle, but he is in fact a member of nobility. And of course we need to be specific, the way he would look at the world and think about cultural perspective, technological perspective, architectural perspective. So being specific with the time of resurrection is important. Who is this person and where is he coming from? Wouldn't it be great to have a medieval knight play a game set in the medieval period? If a knight sees a game, it would, particularly if it's one of those beautiful, brightly coloured games that are set in like medieval fantasy, he would think that we are basically animating a painting. Isn't that a really cool way to think about it, particularly if it's like third person, but even first person? You're basically doing what he could only do with his imagination. Look at a beautiful painting of a castle and then you imagine, imagine if I could walk inside and then walk those paths and go up the mountain. It makes me want to play some video games now that imagine it this way and then go inside the castle and maybe meet people there and go into great adventures I'm sure they imagined stuff like this. The idea of painting being a portal or a mirror into a completely different world, well that is what a video game would look to a medieval knight. So I think it would be mesmerized, at least I would be if I was the medieval knight in question. And that's why if I were to show a video game to a medieval knight, I was showing first a medieval one, or maybe an ancient Roman one, something that he could relate to and it would connect to him psychologically before I showing freaking need for speed and confuse the hell out of him. The medieval period, depending on how you count it, would have lasted up to a thousand years. One thousand years. A knight from the early medieval period and a knight from the late medieval period are different, not to mention which country is he from. So I think to be very standard, I want to say we are resurrecting a knight from the 13th century. So it's already sort of a little bit in the middle, if you will. Let's say that he's a knight from Italy, just because, you know, shut up. It's a from Italy. Of course, a unified Italy wasn't a thing, but do keep in mind that the word Italia has existed, not only it existed in the medieval period, but it has existed since ancient Rome, as I have said numerous times. Now that you have identified that, let's discuss the various elements or chapters to this speculation. We will show our medieval knight, our food, the architecture, technology, our religions, language, culture, clothes, weapons and war, and then our money. On top of that, we could discuss a little bit about medicine, entertainment, transportation, perhaps even politics. And of course, there are a lot of other things we could say, but for now, let's keep it concise, shall we? Let's begin with these. Alright, starting with the food, I would like to underline that to a medieval knight, if we were introduced, let's say that that's the first room you resurrected him, it's inside a room, so he still hasn't seen the outside world, but you do feed him and you give him a choice of lots of different vegetables and meats and all the kind of food that is available to us now. Well, first and foremost, of course, once again, very much will depend on where and what sort of country's food you're going to show him, because clearly if you give him Japanese food, then that would be completely foreign to him. But let's say that you give him European food, and that again, that's massive, like, but let's say a little bit of it, modern Italian food, you give him French food, you give him English food, and you give him American food. I think what's interesting about this discussion is that the first thing that a medieval knight from the 13th century in Europe would notice is that the colors are different. And this is really fascinating. When you look at vegetables today, and oftentimes even in representations in movies and video games that are set in the medieval period, we see orange carrots, we see bell peppers that are red, 
red and green and generally speaking everything looks like today and in fact the only difference is perhaps an abundance of vegetables in video games and films that are set in the medieval period which I mean it makes sense it was definitely available to many people depending on where they were from and social class but in general vegetables were available to everyone and clearly we have this idea that their food and dietary habits would have been healthier than ours particularly if you compare it to freaking McDonald's now, even though that's true for a nobleman he would have definitely had a lot more options than say someone who was poor or even a member of the lower class up to middle class a nobleman had access to lots of things for example our knight wouldn't think it's weird for us to offer him chicken because at the end of the day noblemen could eat chickens but then again people who belong to the lowest strata of society well a chicken is a lame bird so <laughs> you know it can continually produce eggs and therefore make you money so unless you're really wealthy you're not gonna do that so if we give him chicken perhaps even though for us it's like oh yeah it's just chicken but for him it might be like oh they're treating me well and if he was a peasant which could be our next video speculation he would be impressed by that but as i was saying colors when it comes to vegetables would have been different purple would have been a lot more common when it comes to carrots and other vegetables that in our day have now become orange because we have sort of artificially made them so or in a way sort of guided the selective forces that change or mutate certain vegetables in order to become the way they are now which is based on what we like also there would be a lot of foods that he wouldn't even know existed for example anything that originated in america potatoes no idea sweet corn whatever the heck that is bread was absolutely present in the diets of people for, <laughs> i want to say for thousands and thousands of years so a medieval knight would absolutely recognize bread and eat it with that being said we have to remember that bread in the medieval period would have been made slightly different and that look a little different to what he was used to now tomatoes would blow his mind the big juicy red tomatoes definitely for a 13th century night no idea whatsoever what that is but now dear noble ones i would like to take a moment to mention the kind sponsor that made this video possible Magic Spoon! Now if you're a cereal lover, like I am, but you stopped eating cereal because of all the extra sugar and also because you want to, you know, have a bit more protein in the morning rather than just having a flood of carbs, then Magic Spoon is an excellent choice for you because it provides a lot of protein and no sugar. It's the exact opposite. Magic Spoon cereal has 13 to 14 grams of protein, 0 grams of sugar and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs in each serving. Now apart from the cereal boxes, Magic Spoon also offers these treats. Magic Spoon treats have 11 to 12 grams of protein, 1 gram of sugar and 1 to 2 grams of net carbs. Could you imagine if a medieval knight had access to something like this in the morning? Now when it comes to the protein bars, they are chewy, they are tasty, they are airy, but without the stickiness of protein bars. This is fantastic. Take it with you, for example, if you're going to work, you're going to train, it's great as a pre-workout, but also in general as a snack if you're just a little hungry. And there are plenty of flavors you can choose from. Magic Spoon is keto-friendly, high-protein, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free, and naturally flavored. And of course, if you're someone who is celiac, diabetic, in general watching your sugar intake, then Magic Spoon becomes both a wholesome and delicious option. All right, so what are you waiting for use my code metatron or click the link in the description below to try magic spoon cereal or treats with a five dollars off and you can also find magic spoon on amazon or in your nearest grocery store and magic spoon is so confident with their product that it comes with a 100 percent happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason you'll get your money back no questions asked so click the link in the description below go to magicspoon.com metatron for five dollars off your order and massive thanks to magic spoon for sponsoring my video Another massive difference when it comes to the food before we move to the next uh, chapter is the fact of availability of foods in the sense that in the medieval period everything was seasonal so there were certain foods that you could only eat in winter certain foods that you could only eat in spring or in summer and that's how it was whereas in our day and age we're used to I get whatever I want whenever I want it and of course game would have been something that a medieval knight really liked so some sort of meats that for us perhaps some people eat them absolutely but like deer meat for instance my father-in-law loves it but then again you know that's kind of depends on the situation and the knight would be similar to a modern hunter when it comes to that in fact knights liked doing that as a sporting experience hunting and horse riding 
Another thing that might be quite different, and I probably should dedicate a whole video to it, would be the sort of fats that are used in our kitchens, particularly to fry. In the sense that even though, once again, in our supermarkets we have access to anything and we can literally choose. What do you want to use? Butter? Do you want to use oil? In the medieval period, very much would depend on where you're from. So in Italy, in Greece, absolutely olive oil would have been the preferred type of fat and something that if we offer a knight, he would very much appreciate and recognize. But when it comes to Nordic countries, it would be more common instead to use butter rather than oil and that would be a very different demarcation if you will between what was available in one country that wasn't available in other countries. As we take Sir Richard out of his room and then into the outside world his reaction would really depend on where we place him. If we take him to New York or Tokyo first of all the height of the buildings the skyscrapers it would be probably very confusing and let me tell you something even as a modern person and I have lived in Tokyo when I went to New York for the first time what's interesting is that I was in Brooklyn and I got into the underground and went into Manhattan so my very first experience at seeing all of those skyscrapers and correct me if I'm wrong but I think Manhattan is over 500 once again correct me if I'm wrong my first experience was directly from the underground or the subway so when I came out of the subway and looked up there were all of these skyscrapers I think I was somewhere in Times Square or near Hell's Kitchen and I saw all of these skyscrapers which were tall thin and sort of closely packed if you will and that really gave me a strong impression that is Honestly, I'm very happy that that's how I first experienced Manhattan, directly from the subway or the underground. So I can imagine that even though a knight would have seen amazing cathedrals and great castles and fortresses, so let's remember the medieval architecture was quite advanced and really impressive, something like a huge, super tall structure of glass and steel would be disorienting to say the least. In fact, it's also possible that a medieval person might feel a little dizziness and I strongly think that that's very reasonable when it comes to the sort of psychological underpinning of being overwhelmed by what you see. Everything would look alien to him. And even though I'm not trying to attempt any poetry here, but it's possible that to him, the buildings in, in central New York and Manhattan, lower Manhattan and what you, whatnot, might be described as giant mirrors of steel that constantly reflect your countenance and the sun. Now clearly, as I was saying, if you take said knight and you put him in one of those little uh, villages and towns that you still have, for example, in central Italy, maybe in Tuscany, which still look pretty medieval, you've got a few like that in Germany, you've got a couple like that in England, they probably wouldn't really recognize too much of a difference when it comes to the architecture. So once again, very much would depend. And, and, and clearly, if you take him to faraway lands, if you take him to the Middle East, well, maybe the Middle East, if he's been on the Crusades, perhaps he might recognize a pattern but if you take him to to Japan or to China and when I say China I mean more like the, the shrines rather than, than the buildings which would be very similar to New York then clearly completely alien experience for him all right next I'd like to mention technology this is probably the broadest of all chapters so excuse me if I simplify a little bit but when it comes to technology there is a wonderful quote that I think most of you have heard which says sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic and of course the idea of magic is something that a medieval knight was clearly familiar with there is no reason not to imagine that to a knight this, particularly with all the little pictures appearing of people talking and our screens and monitors and the way we create light or flames, is all magic. In a way, he might think that we are either some sort of wizards or that we have divine power. Either that or it's all witchcraft and it all comes from the devil. Also, if he would meet me, he would probably think my hair is too long. I mean, unless he thinks I'm some kind of Samson from the Bible, in which case, you know, probably that's how I would tell him so that he doesn't, you know, hate on me. I mean, medieval knights did have long hair. I've got a few videos also depending on what you consider to be long, but in general, my length of hair is kind of more common to medieval women, whereas a medieval knight would have like shoulder length hair. So like imagine if I cut it here, then probably it would look normal. Some knights would have a fringe so that it doesn't, you know, get kind of similar to the 80s singers, if you will, unless you're talking about the Norman knights, in which case they would have like sh shaved sides and very short hair in the top. Kind of depends. But yeah, so he would either think I'm some kind of biblical figure or that I'm some kind of 
noble because remember that the Merovingian kings and princes all had very long hair so he might think I'm a noble <laughs> which is kind of funny because you know noble ones and whatnot but now let's talk about language that's another part that would be interesting could we even communicate with a medieval knight well of course we do have people who focus and specialize in medieval English and even all the way back to old English in the you know for the Anglo-Saxons and whatnot so clearly yes if you get an expert they could totally talk to a medieval knight but if someone is not trained it would be extremely difficult to understand him and vice versa so if you just speak modern English to or even modern Italian since the guy we said was Italian if we try to speak modern Italian to a medieval knight it would be sometimes we could understand each other particularly if you try like as Italians we do read for instance the Divine Comedy and we can generally speaking kind of figure out what it's talking about but there are sometimes entire verses or specific words that we don't recognize I think there is less of a difference between medieval Italian and modern Italian than there is between medieval English and modern English with that being said in both cases it wouldn't be easy for the knight to recognize our words and we might be able to recognize some but sometimes communication might be impeded in which case we would need a linguist or someone who is specialized and already knows how to speak their own language now the languages we speak would sound completely foreign to him, both in terms of pronunciation and structure, grammatical order, syntax and whatnot. And interestingly enough, since we touched upon English very briefly, do remember that in England, and when it comes to the development and evolution of English as a language, we have something called GVS, or a phenomenon called the Great Vowel Shift. And if you look at the way English has evolved its pronunciation, which goes into stages, but let's just put it this way, when you say something like moon and blood that don't rhyme, even though they're both spelled with double O, well in the medieval period they probably would have rhymed and they would have both sounded with an O sound, which is something you do, for instance even in modern English, when you pronounce words that end with an R, like door or floor. This is probably how every word was pronounced that had double O, whereas today, book, blood, flood, floor, it's kind of crazy. Similarly, every time you pronounce an I as an I, so you say time, you say side, in the medieval period it was probably pronounced like an E. So rather than saying night, you would say knicht. I know it sounds very Germanic. In fact, medieval English did sound a, a bit more Germanic than modern English. So what happened with GVS, probably have to make a dedicated video, is that initially what was pronounced E, like you do in machine, became A, which then evolved into I. And it's interesting that in some, for example, Scottish accents, they stayed at the A. That's why sometimes they, you hear people saying, all right, tame, yeah depending on which part of the medieval period, if it's the late medieval period, they would already started sounding like that. Fascinating stuff. All right, let's talk about religion. Well, a medieval knight, we could say 99% this guy is a Christian, and most likely it's obviously a Catholic. I mean, when I say most likely, it's because there were other religions, for example, the Cathars, although they don't end up very well, so once again, it depends on the period. But let's say this guy is an Italian knight, let's say he's a Roman Catholic. As a Roman Catholic of the medieval period, he would probably make the most ultra-conservative faith and flag Christian of today appear as a very open-minded person when it comes to religion. So, of course, it would depend. The institution of the church in his mentality is not disconnected from the state. Whereas in our day and age, yes, of course, the Vatican still has power. A lot of the power is either influence or economic power. But in the medieval period, the Vatican also has military power. The church is very strongly intertwined in people's day-to-day -day life. Peasants went to church to pay taxes, at least some of the taxes. Peasants and general people, including medieval knights, would have a lot of their holidays, which by the way they had more than we do, I know, right? A lot of their holidays would, let's say, fluctuate around centers of worship. So the church was strongly connected to the ruling power. In fact, sometimes church and state would collide, particularly with the Holy Roman Empire. So in other words, for a knight, if we looked at how religion works today, some of the things we say and we take for granted, like the idea of, what do you mean the church doesn't decide who the king is or who the president is? Why doesn't the church choose that? Like for a knight, it would look like a very different type of Christianity. And clearly that is if we still bring him to, to a Roman Catholic parish, if you will, or a cathedral. But imagine if we take the knight into a, a Jehovah's Witnesses center, or if we go to Latter-day Saints, I mean, this would look 
even more different from the form of Christianity that he is used to. And of course, depending on whether the knight was resurrected before the Protestants were even a thing, even that concept, the idea of what do you mean you're not a Catholic, would sound very foreign to him. But if it's after the Protestant Revolution, then it would really depend on where he's from. Clothes is another thing I wanted to focus on because right now I am wearing medieval clothing. When I film my videos, I love wearing this doublet, which is a 15th century arming doublet in the sense that this is specifically the type of military garment that was worn by medieval knights under their full plate armor and you can see that because I've got points here so these little cords that you see here they are covered in beeswax and then they've got these brass ending they are used to connect the plates of your harness so this is for armor and sometimes they're left like this like I do and other times they're tied and we see that in iconography in fact this is based on some paintings specifically paintings by Piero della Francesca who is a Tuscan 15th century painter and he's great at painting armor by the way it's just that in his painting this is red we based it on that it was recreated by medievaldesign.com not sponsored but I wanted it blue here we are so as you can see medieval clothing particularly in the late medieval period but in general medieval clothing is quite pompous at the top makes your shoulders pretty big your arms pretty big but then it becomes very very thin and tight when it comes to your legs and another thing that medieval people loved was to use lots of different colors particularly if you were noble and this guy is a noble you could have afforded all sorts of hats and all sorts of clothing with lots of different types of silks perhaps and even garments like this one which is inside its hem like my brigandine which as you know it's hand spun silk velvet so the medieval period had wonderful colors wonderful clothing and in my opinion their fashion was better than ours for a medieval woman even if it wasn't a noble woman even if it was like a, a member of the lower class it, they would have to have several layers and if you don't have at least three layers you are in your undergarments so for a medieval knight seeing a modern women the way they dress or even more so the fact that there isn't necessarily too much difference between the way a man dresses and the way a woman dress in the sense that you can have a guy and a girl they're both wearing t-shirt and a jean and a pair of jeans whereas in the medieval period the sexes were completely dressed in very different ways so that would be a little confusing now when it comes to weapons and war again a knight is a warrior, he's a soldier, he's a professional. So at the end of the day, that's probably something that he would be mostly interested in when it comes to the power that we have. When you show him weapons of mass destruction, to him, we have the power of God. We are unstoppable, it's unthinkable. To put it into perspective, it would be like if we went in the future, like a thousand, a thousand and five hundred years or two thousand years in the future, and then the people from the future tell us that they now have weapons that are capable of destroying an entire planet, or weapons that are capable of destroying an entire solar system. That is the level of difference between the sort of weapons of mass destruction like thermonuclear weapons or ICBMs that we control now compared to the sort of weaponry that a medieval knight was used to in his time. But removing those for a moment, I think the fact that we focus so much on ranged weapons could be an interesting but logical step of evol evolutionary step when it comes to arms and armor because at the end of the day medieval knights were very familiar with range weapons from longbows like the Mary Rose, very powerful high poundage longbows to crossbows and mercenary bodies of crossbowmen. A knight is familiar with the idea of you can shoot someone from a distance. In fact, if he's a very practicing Catholic, so then again the religion kind of steps in, um, he might consider those to be uh, not very good because at the end of the day the medieval papacy tried with their own bills and edicts to ban crossbows and bows both by the way oftentimes when you hear about this ban you only hear the crossbows is both crossbows and bows and the church said you can't use it between christians of course medieval kingdoms completely ignored that ban so if the knight is very very religious catholic then he would be oh no 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 that should be banned yeah good luck with that but if he's not like many medieval knights weren't because again a lot of knights were like yeah, yeah i'm religious i believe in christ but the pope is saying i can't use my crossbows i'll still use crossbows and crossbowmen and units of archers if he's that type he's a christian but he doesn't necessarily care about those things and then in that situation he might see the advantage of the power of our rifles and in general firearms to be something incredible. He would enjoy the idea of, hey, now I can take down my enemies. So very much would depend and definitely would be very open-minded to the tactical opportunities that modern weaponry provide. Because remember, yes, he's a medieval knight. He's still a strategist. 
still someone who understands more, particularly if he's a veteran of war. Now I'd like to focus on transportation. Transportation is another thing that would be mind-blowing. Remember, a knight doesn't know that we can fly. I imagine that we as a species have been dreaming of being able to fly since probably the Stone Age. Whenever we would see birds flying in the sky, we would imagine, oh, could you imagine if I could fly? And of course, people like Leonardo da Vinci and other medieval inventors and engineers have tried to create and build machines that could allow humans to fly and imitate and emulate the birds in nature. So the knight could understand the concept. That wouldn't be difficult to understand, but it would still marvel at the idea that we have indeed achieved the ability to fly. And then when you tell a knight, you know, you fly for eight hours, you'll be on the other side of the planet in America. Mind you, you'll have to explain what America is first, but say that you did and you could do that or you could fly from Italy, from Rome to France, and you can do it in a couple of hours, it would be mind-blowing. Because of course for a knight the idea is you either walk, you ride your horse, it takes days to go to a place, or you take a ship and then it might take months to whatever location you're trying to go. So in a way I think the idea in which we can understand the disproportionate speed at which movement and relocation occurred in the medieval period and how it occurs in the present day is once again if we imagine that in a thousand years in the future a trip to Mars which now takes I believe a year, imagine that they have technology that would allow you to do do that in say a day or a week. In order for us to put ourselves in the shoes of a medieval knight, that's a good way to look at transportation. Imagine a location that is really far away, or even like, you know, now we fly for eight hours, imagine that they have a propulsion of systems that allow you to instead move from Rome to Los Angeles and you do it in one hour or you do it in 15 minutes. That's the type of oh my gosh, that you could experience if you think that in the future, and that would probably put you in the position or in the shoes, very nice shoes by the way, so talking about the style of a medieval knight having been introduced to the sort of transportation technology that we have. Regardless, I think as a first speculative little introduction, this is good for this video. But if you like this sort of videos, share it, leave a comment below, watch it three times in a row, because, you know, if this video goes very well, we can continue not only to resurrect more people, like someone from the Stone Age, for example, oh, that would be fun, but at the same time, we could expand on these, like perhaps introducing other concepts. And of course, if you have other ideas, let me know in the comments. Also, don't forget to take advantage of the amazing offer Magic Spoon has for you through the link in the description. But as always, thank you so much for watching Noble Ones, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.